Good morning. Welcome to St. James. Glad you guys are here. Welcome to everybody who's uh, um, watching online right now. Uh, t- take attendance. Um, there uh, should be guest books, registers down at the end of your row. Uh, sign your name in that and your address, especially if you're visiting, and pass that down the road to the people sitting around you. Uh, you can also take the attendance. Uh, uh, how, what's the word for this? Uh, digitally, by clicking on or by uh, using the QR code on the back of the bullets in there, uh, you can sign up that way. Um, what else do I want to say about that? I don't think anything. Let me talk about the schedule this week. There's a few changes that we need to talk about. First of all, there's no new members class tonight. Um, so my family is doing Mother's Day this evening, and so I won't be there. You're welcome to show up, those of you who are in the new members class, and hang out and talk about whatever you want to talk about. <clears throat> but I won't be here, so uh, that's uh, no new members class tonight at 6. Also, no Zoom Bible study on the great divorce this uh, Wednesday evening. I had an, uh, um, another responsibility pop up that's going to get in the way of that as well. All right, let me point out uh, one more thing to you, and then we're, we're going to get going here. Uh, high school graduates are going to be celebrated on May 22nd, and that's going to be uh, this year's graduates, but also last year's graduates as well, because we didn't do anything last year. We were in the middle of all the uh, figuring out what to do with services and stuff. And so if you have, uh, if you are or in your family, there is a high school graduate that you want recognized uh, from last year as well as this year. Could you let uh, Cheryl know by this week? We're going to do that May 22nd. Also May 22nd is our youth uh, confirmation. And so we're going to celebrate the confirmands. I mean, we're going to do the confirmation in the service. But then after the service, during the Bible study hour, we're going to recognize, uh, we're going to have some cake and we're going to recognize the youth confirmands and talk about confirmation and also recognize the high school graduates. And uh, one more thing that I want to say about May 22nd, which is this. Um, I want all of you guys to, pl- pl- to, to show up to Bible study and then to come to um, after, after the Bible study on May 22nd, we're going to have, this is the first time we're doing this, we're going to have a ministry fair. Now, this is a very, very important principle. I've talked about this in, in, in sermons before, and I want us all to kind of buy into this because it's biblical, is that it's not the pastor's job to do the work of the ministry. That's kind of an old school idea where I do the ministry work and you guys, like you show up and, you know, you support and you sing, you know, put your money in the offering plate and sing hymns and stuff like that. But actually the Bible's vision of the way the church works is that all of us are doing the work of the ministry. God has given each one of you a spiritual gift to use in serving the community here and in serving Glen Carbon. And now some of you aren't doing that and one of the main reasons I think is because you just don't know what to do. If you have a spiritual gift but you might not know what it is and you don't know how to use it if you do. And so here's what we're gonna do. On May 22nd, we're gonna have a ministry fair which is after the service, both the service and the Bible say we're going to meet downstairs and lunch will be provided by the church. And each one of the deacons and deaconesses is going to be set up with kind of a, a little display or just, I don't know how, how each one of them is going to make it look, but a presentation of what it is that they and their team do. And they're going to invite you to kind of roam around and uh, eat food and talk to each of the booths, the deacons and the deaconesses. And be praying and thinking about which one of these teams can I get involved with and help serve. So that we're all working together as one body doing the work that God has called us to do here. And it's not just a Sunday morning event where we show up and listen to an admittedly fantastic sermon. But throughout the whole week, we're each serving with the gifts that God has given us. That's going to be May 22nd, so a big day. A couple weeks from now, put it on your calendar. And I think that's all I have by way of... Um, Uh, by way of announcement. So let's go ahead and stand and we'll sing the opening hymn.
Let's continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let's confess our sin to God. O Lord, great God, whom we behold in awe and wonder, who has kept covenant and steadfast love with your people from age to age, we have sinned and done wrong, enacted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. We have known in our hearts what is right, and yet we did wrong anyway. We have been fascinated by evil, delighted with pleasing ourselves, satisfying our desires, serving ourselves with pleasures. O Lord, great God, have mercy on us according to your steadfast love. We know you are a God who delights in goodness. Grant that we too might delight in goodness. We know you are a God who rejoices in peace and justice. Grant that we might be at peace with ourselves and each other. O Lord, great God, grant that our hearts might be filled with the love of justice, with peace beyond understanding, with patience, with joy. These prayers we present to you, O Father, in the name of Jesus, the Lamb who was slain and yet lives forevermore. Because of Jesus, God has forgiven all our sin. Hear the gospel of Christ from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Amen. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let's say Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
may be seated. Old Testament reading is Ezekiel 36, 22 through 30. And I want you to notice something in here as we read through. I want you to notice how Ezekiel connects. He connects uh, the sprinkling of clean water, the new birth, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Those three things in this, in this text uh, from uh, 400 years before Jesus. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you've profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. And here we go, start noticing these connections. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my just decrees. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. And I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant. That you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ephesians 5, 25 through 32 is about husbands who are supposed to love their wives like Christ. I mean, one thing I want to point out to you for the sermon here, which is a great text, but is of course, I mean, this is one of my favorite texts about baptism, is in verse 26, the washing of water with the word. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? I'm not saying it's easy to understand these things, but we did just read in Ezekiel 36 how the washing of water and the giving of the Spirit and the new heart, the new birth, are all connected. Nicodemus probably has read this text before. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 11, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So uh, this morning, I want to talk about baptism, and uh, as we get going here, could you actually do me a favor? Could you turn in your Bibles to Titus? This isn't in the bulletin, but if you could turn to Titus 3, it's, uh, page, two, it's page 887 in your pew Bibles, or uh, uh, you can look it up on your phone, whatever you want to do, but we're going to look through Titus 3, 4 through 7, and we're going to be sitting in it just for a few minutes, and so it would be helpful if you would be reading along with me as I read it out loud to you too. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to talk about baptism. And so I, I do this, this was kind of my goal, is to annually talk very explicitly. I mean, baptism and the, and, and, and the Lord's Supper come up a lot, you know, in, in, as we study the Bible together and as I preach. But one of the things I want to do is at least once a year, I want to speak uh, explicitly to baptism or the Lord's Supper. I talked about the Lord's Supper about a month ago, and my plan originally was to talk about, the, about baptism kind of in the middle of the summer. And then we've had a lot of baptisms recently, and I thought this would be a good time while we're kind of all thinking about it, and we've all witnessed it, it would be a good time to do it now. So I want to talk about baptism this morning, if I can. And um, let me start by just saying this, is that um, many, uh, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the larger evangelical church have a problem with what I'm about to say 
Give me a second. Thank you. What am I about to say about baptism? Saving. Baptism regenerating us and saving us. Baptism being God's tool that he uses to bring people to faith. Not the only tool he has in his belt. The Holy Spirit's got a lot of tools in his belt. The word of God is the main tool, right? But the word of God is like a Swiss army knife to the Holy Spirit. He can use it with his word. He can use it preached. He can use it heard in song. He can use it in water form. Let's talk about this morning. He use it in bread and wine form. The Holy Spirit has lots of tools in his tool belt to use to bring us to faith and to sanctify us. But a lot of evangelicals have a problem with this because they think that if I say that baptism saves us, that I'm denying like basic reformational doctrine. A lot of you have heard, all of you who are Lutherans, of course, have heard about the three big reformational solas. Uh, sola uh, gratia, which is a Latin phrase that means so, by, by grace alone. God saves us by grace alone. Uh, it's purely his initiative. It's his decision to rescue us and save us, not because of anything that we've brought to the table, not our own reason or strength, as Luther says in the small catechism. There's sola fide, we're saved by faith alone. We're not saved by any works that we do or anything that we, again, that we bring or offer to God as, you know, sort of compensation for the gift that he gives us. It's, we purely receive by faith. And then a sola scriptura is the third one. Salvation is brought to us solely by God's word. And God's word is the one, one normative standard by which we judge truth, right and wrong, is by God's word. And a lot of people will say, a lot of evangelists, the, the people that I grew up with, would say, the churches that I grew up in would say, that if you say that baptism saves, it's a denial of these three doctrines because it introduces works into salvation, it introduces a man-made deed into what should only be God's work in saving us. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to, and I haven't done this in here before, but this is, I, you know, I got to figure out different ways to talk to you guys about baptism, is uh, two things. One is I, I want to talk about baptism and what it means for these three solas, uh, sola gratia, sola fide, and sola scriptura, sola scriptura. And second of all, I just want to make a quick caveat. I'm not interested this morning in talking about infant baptism. I know that that's an important topic. We can save that for another day. I'll touch on it briefly near the end, but I'm not arguing here for infant baptism. I'm, what I want to do is I want to do two things. I want to argue that baptism saves us, and it feels weird that I have to say argue for it because the Bible just actually says it. But second of all, I want to do, I, this is not so much the Baptists are wrong and we're right. I'm not interested in that so much as I am in offering to all of us the hope and comfort that comes from knowing that God has objectively put his word on us and in us. I want us to get hope and comfort from that. And that's going to be kind of my main goal. So let's work through the solas this morning. Let's start off with sola gratia. Sola, so, uh, by, by grace alone. Salvation is by grace alone. And let me just point out that in Scripture, and now we're going to go to Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. In Scripture, baptism is always pictured as entirely a gift of God's grace. It's entirely a gift of God's grace. So if you guys could look with me at Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. Let me read this, and then I'm going to, say, I'm going to point out three things about it real quickly. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, Paul says, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So now you can see Paul is tugging on these themes from Ezekiel and John. He's going to the prophets, he's going to Jesus, and he's offering up to us the hope and comfort that comes from knowing that God has saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on, he, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Three things I want to point out from Titus 3, 4 through 7 this morning about salvation and God's plan to save us. First of all, the motive. The motive in this text is purely loving and gracious and merciful on God's part. So there's three things in here about what motive. God to save me and you. And the first answer, of course, is love. Verse, look at verse four. When the kindness and love, kindness in the Bible is, it's God's love with legs on it. Like, so, so God's love, you could understand that as like God has these passionate feelings for you, which is true. 
But, but more than that, I mean, that's, that's, that's nice, but it's not helpful for us if God just has good feelings for us but doesn't do anything to act on those good feelings. God is loving, but God is also kind. His love has legs. He actually does stuff. First of all, God is loving. Second of all, God is gracious. Look down at verse seven. So that having been justified by his grace, everything that we're gonna talk about in salvation always comes from God's grace. Grace is God's giving us something good that we don't deserve. It flows out of his love and his kindness for us. But God saves us even though, that we, don't, even though we don't deserve it because he is a gracious God. And the third thing that we know about God's motive from this text is that God is merciful. Look at the back end of verse five. God saved us because of his mercy because of his mercy. God's mercy is his withholding punishment from us that we do deserve. Grace is giving us good things that we don't deserve. Mercy is withholding punishment from us, but withholding bad things from us that we do deserve. So what am I saying? Love, grace, mercy, what does it all mean? It means that God's motive to save us is not to reward us for something that we've done, or not to say, well, I kind of owe it to you guys since I created you, and I, you know, maybe I'm somehow responsible for everything that's gone wrong. It's none of that. It's God's pure love for us and his desire to do good things for us just simply because he loves us. That's his motive. What is his means? The means is, verse five, baptism. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us. Look at all that water language, the washing of of renewal and rebirth by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. And you can see here now that, 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 that Paul is tugging on these themes from Ezekiel 36 and John 3. When I rescue you someday, Ezekiel says, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water. I'm going re- to re- give you a new birth. I'm going to give you a brand new heart. And I'm going to pour my spirit out on you. Jesus says the same thing. He basically says to Nicodemus, you've read the prophets. What's going to happen when the Messiah comes? New birth. There's going to be a washing. This washing. And there's going to be the Holy Spirit. If, you, if you're not born of water and the Spirit you won't experience the new birth. Jesus is just saying the same thing that Ezekiel said. Paul is saying those exact same things. Now, before you get to like, well, how does this work? Just, just kind of sit in this for a second, okay? Don't, we'll get to the mechanics of it. Maybe it's kind of a big, bold claim that probably can't pay out on. But we'll get to those sorts of topics in a minute. Right now, just sit in this text that God, because of his love, grace, and mercy, has decided to rescue us and give us new birth in the Holy Spirit. And the way that he does that is by washing us. The way he does that is through baptism. Some of you will notice that when it says that he saves us through the washing of rebirth, he also, pour, he also points out the Holy Spirit. This happens by the Holy Spirit. Baptism by the Holy Spirit. And so some of us might say, in fact, many of my evangelical friends would say, oh, well, there you go. It's not really baptism. It's just a, a sort of metaphorical washing. Washing is like a, an image of God giving us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the real thing. That's the real valuable thing, the internal thing. The physical washing that happens in baptism, that may be kind of like a metaphor for it or a symbol of it, but it's actually, that's kind of secondary, which is interesting because he mentions the washing first before he gets to the Holy Spirit. But let me just point out to you, like I I try to point this out a a lot in here, is that the Bible's never gonna let us divide these two things up. It's never gonna let us be like, the spiritual is important, but the physical, that's just kind of like, it's an object lesson or it's a mere symbol. The Bible always puts the physical and the spiritual together in ways that you and I are normally completely comfortable with. But if you walk inside of an American church, all of a sudden they get ripped apart. Like I say, but but in normal ways, we're entirely comfortable with the fact that love and grace and mercy, if it's not shown physically, it doesn't matter if it's spiritual, if it's internal. Love, if it's gonna make sense, has to be both physical and spiritual. This is why, by the way, that when you experience intimacy, physical intimacy in your marriage, you would never in a million years say, hey, you know that physical intimacy? That's, that's a symbol of my love for you. No, we actually call it love making because that's what it is. Sex within marriage is not a symbol of love. It is love itself. Now, to have sex within marriage but not to have anything else, not to have like attention, devotion, commitment. That's also bad. Nobody's saying that it's okay to do that. But to have good feelings in marriage with no physical intimacy is also, you would also say that's not loving either because we all understand, everybody who's married or has been married understands that the two things go together. The physical and the spiritual are all tied up with each other. Get it with that. If I invite you over to my house 
And Angela and I, we devote like a whole evening to preparing a bunch of tasty food for you. And we clean the house up and we sit you down in our dining room and we serve you food and we make sure that you're entirely comfortable and that you don't have to do anything and that we bring the food and we clean up afterwards. We would never, we would never explain what happened in that meal in terms of, hey, we invited you over here to give you this meal as a symbol of our friendship. We would never do that. What we would say instead is like, this is friendship. This, us serving you food and taking care of you, that is friendship. And, you would, and maybe, some, maybe some, an evangelical might say, well, oh, but maybe it's not really a friendship. Maybe it's just, it's just physical, so you don't really mean it inside. And I would say, well, maybe. I guess we could invite you over for dinner and make a bunch of tasty food and not really like you and not really have a friendship. That would be kind of weird. The ideal is both. But if we really are friends, the physical is going to be involved. And we would never say that the meal is a symbol of our friendship. We would say this is friendship in action. This is friendship personified. Similarly, this is one of my favorite examples, of course, you wouldn't hug your child and say, my hug for you is a symbol of my love for you. No, actually the love, the hug is itself love. And you would say, this is entirely appropriate. I have feelings of love for my child. I also physically express my love for my child. If I try to separate those two things, I am being a bad parent. That part of being a parent is physically embodying the reality of the love that I feel and know for my child. But somehow, American Christians, when they come to the sacrament of baptism, want to rip those things apart and say, God loves us, but baptism, that's just a mere symbol. And that's just not the way love and grace and mercy ever work. Love, if it's anything, has to be both physical and internal, psychological, emotional, mental, spiritual, however you want to term it. Those two things must always go together. That's the means, baptism. God gives us his love and grace and mercy physically. Physically in Holy Communion and in baptism. And last, we have the motive, we have the means, and finally, the man behind salvation. Our salvation is accomplished through Jesus Christ. Look at verse six. He saved us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's the same language that he uses for baptism. He saves us through Jesus Christ. He saves us through the washing of rebirth. Why would Paul use the same preposition for both things? Why would salvation be through baptism and also through Jesus? And the reason why is, you guys know this, baptism isn't just like this ritual that we do the water is just normal water. The altar guild turns on the tap back there in the utility room and puts it in there. It's just H2O. I am just a normal dude filled with way more sins than you guys are filled with who shows up and says the words of institution and puts the water on the bed. It's just normal water. It's not magical water. How can we say that through baptism, the salvation that comes through Jesus gets connected to each other? And the answer is right there because baptism is directly connected to Jesus. The Bible insists, Paul insists, Peter insists, Jesus insists that baptism and Jesus go hand in hand. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 6 where Paul makes this super explicit. Paul says this, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him by baptism. So in other words, so my evangelical friends would say, yeah, but when it uses the word baptism there, it's like spiritual baptism. It's not water baptism. It's really just like union with Christ. But it doesn't make sense that he would say by baptism, that baptism would be a tool. In other words, it, it, it doesn't make any sense that Paul would say, you were buried by union with Christ into union with Christ. That doesn't make any sense at all. Baptism is some sort of instrument there that gets us into union with Christ so that we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see what he's saying? When you are baptized into Jesus Christ, you are connected with Jesus while he was on the cross, dying for our sins. And you're connected with Jesus while he rose from the dead to new life. Do you want the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection? Paul says that the answer to getting those benefits, the way you connect those benefits, is through baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how we connect to that. Baptism, in other words, is not a, it's, it's not something that we offer up to God as payment. It is God's loving, gracious, and merciful instrument to accomplish union with Christ. Now, I'm not leaving that point behind and going on to something different. You'll see that these, these uh, points d definitely overlap. Sola fide, 
is the next thing I want to talk about. By faith alone, this is one of the areas where evangelicals have the biggest problem with baptism because they think it actually undermines the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. After all, how can you say that we're saved by faith alone, but baptism is a part of that? God uses baptism to save us. That can't po- those two things can't possibly be true. In fact, um, there was a, an essay I, I read just recently. Actually, one of you sent it to me. Uh, to look at by a a Presbyterian scholar, pastor, and author named D. Patrick Ramsey. And um, the essay that he wrote was called Sola Fide Compromised, Martin Luther and the Doctrine of Baptism. And the essay is about how Martin Luther compromised Sola Fide by saying we're saved by, uh, by baptism. And here's what he says. Let me read a little bit of this to you. The name of Martin Luther is perpetually linked to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Indeed, the mere mention of this great reformer's name conjured up thoughts of sola fide. So he said, basically, everybody thinks of Martin Luther and they think of sola fide by faith alone. And the reason why is this. For the leading service he bequeathed to the church was the entire destruction of the doctrine of human merit and the thorough establishment of the great scriptural truth of a purely gratuitous, that just means uh, grace-based, justification through faith alone. Luther taught that we're saved by faith alone. In addition to uncovering this hidden gem, Luther exposed its value in teaching that it is the article upon which the church stands or falls. So bully for you, Luther, he says. You discovered, or not discovered, that's a bad way to put it. He shouldn't have used the word discovered here. But you rediscovered, maybe, the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, and you taught it to the church. But he says, these great contributions notwithstanding, it is arguable that Luther's own doctrine of justification by faith alone is compromised by or at least in tension with his doctrine of baptism, particularly his understanding of baptismal regeneration. You see what he's saying? Luther taught salvation by faith alone, but then he went on to say that we're saved by baptism, and that totally compromised what he said, because the two of those things can't be true. You can't be saved by faith alone and saved by baptism. This isn't just scholars who say this. Uh, My uncle Dennis, my mom's brother, who is a wonderful man, uh, is a if you know my mom, you know like the, the DNA pool is solid, really good people. Also, good lifelong friends with Bob and Marilyn Whipke, who I told I was going to name in my sermon, and now I've paid that out. And so if you know Bob and Marilyn Whipke, you know that anybody who would be a friend of them is a really good human being. But uh, he grew up Baptist. My, my, my mom's family uh, was a Baptist. I was Baptist too, um, uh, before be, uh, falling away from faith and then uh, being drawn back to faith by Jesus. Um, but he grew up Baptist and then married my Aunt Bev, who was an LCMS Lutheran. Uh, he went through adult confirmation. Uh, later on in his life, he'd been a Lutheran for maybe, I, I don't know, the math of maybe 30 years, 30, 40 years. But he said, to, he said to me one time, and this is when I was a student at a Presbyterian school. This is a very ecumenical conversation here. I was a Baptist pastor. who was a, a, a student at a Presbyterian school. And he said to me, hey, can you tell me why is it my church teaches that we're saved by faith, But they also say that baptism saves. Like, I don't get that, he said. Like, how do those two things go together? And I said to him, that's a great question. You should maybe ask your pastor, because I don't know. I'm not a Lutheran. So go ask your pastor. Uh, But um, anyway, it's it's just, I I think it's a really good question. How do those two things go together? So let's talk about it now. And let's start off with, I'm going to ask you guys a key question. I'm going to ask you a question, and um, I want you to think about it. I'm going to give you five seconds to quietly ponder uh, what the right answer to this is. And the question is this. Are we saved? Don't, 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 rush to, don't rush to a hasty answer. Are we saved by works or by faith? So are we saved by works or by faith? That's the key question for you to answer. And I want you to think about it for a minute. And I'm giving you time because it's a bit of a trick question. Are we saved by works or faith? And the answer is we're saved by both. We're saved by both. Here's what I mean. Pay attention. You and I, sinful human beings, the only way that we can be saved is by faith. For for me, it's faith alone all day long or I'm done for. Like I'm a screwed up person and I think that you guys would admit that you're screwed up people too. But does that mean that salvation is not by works? No. Why? I hope that everybody's paying attention right here and not listening to what I didn't say. Salvation is by works because God had to do a lot of work to save us. God had to become a human being and live on this earth. 
and get mistreated and abused and assassinated, rise from the dead, and then send his Holy Spirit in order to rescue all of us. So salvation is both by works and by faith. On our part, as humans, purely faith. On God's part, though, he has to do a ton of work to save us. I will agree that baptism is a work. But now the question is, is whose work is it? Is it our work? If it is, then it, then it can't save. It can only damn. But is baptism over in God's part of the ledger? Is, is, is everybody tracking? This is super important. The Bible is super clear. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your homework for this week. Go and read every text that you can find in the New Testament about baptism or washing or sprinkling with clean water or anything like that, and you will find that every time it's not something that we do, it's something that's being done to us. Baptism is always God's work. work. Now, I know I've said this in here before. I'm going to say it again to you. This is a review for some of you. Where does this come from? It comes from the Great Commission. Matthew 28, Jesus tells the very last lines in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus tells his disciples, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does it mean when I baptize somebody in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What does it mean when you do something in the name of somebody else? If I say, I'm here, and you know, look at this is my example with my, 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 uh, my youth confirmands. If the, if, and you guys have heard it here before too. If the law knocks on your door in the middle of the night and pounds on your door and says, open up in the name of the law, what they mean is, is that I, the individual cop, actually don't have the authority to pound on your door in the middle of the night and make you come out. But I am not here as an individual fellow citizen, dressed in blue, armed with a gun. I am here representing the law. And so when they pound on the door, if they do, it happens, this is what happens, they do on Rockford Files. They pound on the door and they say, open up in the name of the law. What, what, the, what the cop is saying is, I'm here representing somebody else. And when I baptize somebody and I do it in the name of the Father, Son, what I'm saying is, is that it's not me, I'm just a dude. I'm doing it, but it's actually, I'm doing it representing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who do baptism. Is baptism a work in the Bible? Yes, absolutely. But it's not our work. It's God's work. It's something that he does to us. So every time you see baptism in Scripture, it's always God doing something to us. It's always God working, God doing the work to use a tool, one particular tool that he has in his tool belt, to create faith in us so that we can be saved. Not by any works that we do, but, but only by the works that he's done and our faith which trust in those works. Last thing and then we'll be done. Soul of Scripture. Again, this is not a separate point. It's all kind of building on itself. But doesn't baptismal regeneration, my uh, evangelical friends might ask, doesn't baptismal regeneration undermine sola scriptura, the doctrine that salvation can only come through the word? Aren't you saying that like, well, now salvation can come through something else? And the answer is no. We read from Ephesians 5 where Paul says that Jesus washes his church with the water of the word. Now, I just quoted that a couple weeks ago during one of the baptisms, I don't remember. But baptism is not just water. It's a washing of the water with the word. If we're saved by the word of God, it's not just the, it's not just the, the pages of this book. It's not just me reading it out loud, although that's the way many of you have come to faith. is through hearing a sermon or by sitting down and studying the Bible, searching for truth. It's also the word of God that comes in and with the water. In fact, this is what Luther says. Luther, this question is, was asked by Luther many times. How can water save people? That seems crass and pagan. That seems like works. If you're saying that water's, and Luther's like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't say that water saves people. I said that baptism saves people. Baptism and water are two different things. Water is just water, but baptism is water and the word mixed together. So when Luther was asked, how can water save? Luther says this. Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts the word of God in the water. God puts his water on us because in baptism, God mixes up his word with that water, puts it on us, creates faith, and when you believe the promises of the word that Jesus died for you, that you belong to him, that you're his child, that you can call him Abba Father, that he's poured his Holy Spirit out on you, 
When, when the word of God, whether it's read or whether it's in liquid form, creates faith in us, we're saved. That's how baptism saves us. He actually saves us through the word. Baptism is sola scriptura because it is the word in water form. But not only that, one more angle on this. Baptism, the doctrine that baptism saves us is also incredibly sola scriptura, and that is, and I was shocked when I became a Lutheran and was kind of hit in the face with this, is that it's actually just the plain meaning of scripture. The, the Bible just says baptism saves you. Let me just shoot you, let me just shoot you a few texts. Text. Of course, 1 Peter 3.21 says this, baptism now saves you. Baptism now saves you. Not, uh, not as a removal of dirt from the body. It's not like a physical, like you're getting your dirt washed off your body. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. Baptism now saves you. Now, when I was a Baptist pastor, you know how I would have handled that text? Baptism now saves you. Well, there's a, d- there's a couple different ways. I can say, that's not really baptism. That's like a spiritual, baptism is kind of a metaphor there, but it doesn't say spiritual baptism. It just uses the word baptism. And I think it's a sola scriptura principle that the word baptism means baptism. It's just the plain, r- plain reading of the text. I could have said, saves doesn't really mean saves. It means like sanctifies. But again, what am I doing? I'm playing gymnastics with the text. I'm having to tweak things in the text to make it fit my theology. And what's better, I think, if sola scriptura is the, is the way to go, I think it's better just to say, baptism now saves you. I'm not sure I know what that means, but I think it means baptism now saves you. A few more texts. Acts 2.38, Peter says to the people at the end of the Pentecost sermon, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why does Peter say that? When I was a Baptist, I would have said, well, he uses the word repent first. So first you have to repent, and then you get baptized as a symbol of the repentance, and then God gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's all kinds of problems with that, which I can talk to you about later at a later date, but the first one I I, want to point out is this, is that I add a bunch of words into this text to make it mean what I want it to mean. The plain and simple meaning, the sola scriptura meaning is, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 10 says this, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. I don't know what I would have done with that. Pretty, pretty explicit there. Part of approaching God with faith is having a body washed with pure water. Paul says again, I just read this a few minutes ago, Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death. No, 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 I would have said as a Baptist pastor, it doesn't mean baptism there, it means union with Christ. And baptism is kind of a metaphor for union with Christ. And let me just say again, if sola scriptura is true, baptism is baptism. Now, why am I saying all this stuff? Why is this all important? I know it it, it a little bit smells like I'm trying to say the Baptist is wrong and I'm right. And I can't avoid that, I guess, because I, 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 I can only preach what I think is right. That's really not my main point. For those of you who know me well, you'll know that there's a big chunk of my heart that is still Baptist. I'm not trying to bash on the Baptist. But one of the main things I'm doing this morning is I want to give you two payouts here. There's a gazillion payouts that we could get from this. One of them is hope and comfort. But the other one is this. And I was just thinking about this recently. I kind of threw this in at the last minute as preparing this sermon out of a conversation that I had with a handful of you. Uh, in, in the past week or so, is that if baptism, if baptism is the way that God saves us, then that means that baptism is the way that we, baptism is what earmarks us as Christians. That's how you get in, is baptism. Now, in, in evangelical Christianity, the way that you become a Christian is by intellectual assent. You might call it faith, we might call it faith, but what we mean by faith as evangelicals would have been, you believe that something is true, and you commit to it intellectually. But, but that, that's created all kinds of problems in the evangelical church, which are going through right now, through what, if you're familiar with this, th- through what is kind of this sort of like, they, they call it the deconstruction. A lot of evangelicals deconstructing their Christianity. Because what's happened is, is because they've built their Christianity on, it, I'm in because I assent to it. I, I believe in it. But now there's different bits and pieces of it that they're starting to say, I don't believe in that anymore. And so... They believe in, some of them believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in what the Bible teaches about human sexuality or about premarital sex or about um, 
uh, any number of other issues that I don't want to get into this morning. So what happens is, is they, I'm going to hold on to these things here. These are the things I believe in. These things over here that the Bible teaches, I don't believe in those. I don't intellectually assent to those anymore. So we can kind of scrap those and call those freedom of conscience. And what's happening is that there's this mass fracturing with evangelicalism. And I think that a better way to look at the, the the better way to look at what does it mean to be a Christian is, have you been baptized into Jesus Christ? And here's why. Because if, if I've been baptized into Jesus Christ, that's objective and it's there. And I can be called into account that like, it doesn't matter, Aaron, whether you think that biblical sexual ethics are important or not. You actually have to subscribe to them because you have been baptized into the God who wrote the Bible. And it's not about your intellectual assent. It's not about your trusting in these individual doctrines. It's about who are you? What's your identity? Is it in Christ? And so I think it's important that we start to identify ourselves, not as people who, you, we all need to believe the gospel. That's true. But that's not what it comes down to first and foremost. It comes down to we've been baptized into Jesus Christ so that we can believe the gospel. That's our new identity. Here's a second payout from this. That, the, the, this, this reality that if you've been baptized into Jesus, that's the way that you should be identified. Let me give you, uh, let me do this real quick. This means, and I told you I was going to talk about infant baptism at the end. I tack this on to the end. So I, don't, I, I should have an argument for infant baptism for you. I don't have the time or I haven't prepared for that sort of thing. But let me just say this. We've baptized our babies, many of us have. And what that means is, is that our babies are full-fledged, regenerate, spirit-filled members of the body of Christ and should be treated as such. Now, for those of you who grew up Lutheran or Catholic where this sort of thing is understood, like you're cool with this. But some of us who've come in from outside, we come into a church service like this and it's kind of nuts in here. Like there's babies yelling, there's babies running around, there's babies army crawling through your legs from two pews behind you. And people are kind of weirded out by it. Like I don't mean like Lutherans and Catholics are usually like, oh, what's up kid? But like if you grew up like non-denom or Baptist, it's like, we usually take our kids and until they're intellectually prepared, we stuff them into children's church where they get to hear, you know, a, a Bible lesson that's appropriate for them. I'm not saying there's anything evil about, about that. I grew up in children's church. But actually, what I want us to learn to say is that like when, when a baby is crying behind you, you should know that that baby, that baptized baby has the Holy Spirit and has a right to praise God in the way that the Spirit is moving it to. Now, this, this also doesn't mean that the parents also don't have a responsibility to say, shh, calm down, or whatever. But it does mean that when Jesus says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, I have ordained praise, sola scriptura, he means that out of the mouths of babes and infants, I have ordained praise. So when you hear a baby crying around you, you should take that as that baby, loved by its father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, lifting its voice in praise to the God who made it and redeemed it and loves it. That's what you should do. Now, here's the payout. There are people, and some of you are sitting in here this morning, like I say, who've come from different backgrounds and have talked to me about like, what, what should I do with my kids, you know, and everything. And all of you know this now. Just do me a favor. Every single one of you who has kids, you've been in the restaurant. You've been on the plane. And the kids start squirming and making noise. And you can see the shoulders of the people around you tense up. And, and the more obnoxious people will kind of give you, a, a, you know, kind of a little look like, you know, how dare you have another human being with you? It's, you know, uh, intruding upon my solitude or my, my nice dinner here. But here, here, so here's what I'm gonna do. you can you, you can possibly do that in church. When people say, when people say, and I, I don't believe it's true about St. James, it's just sort of a refresher. When people say, I went to church and people just did not like my kids there, they were all kind of like uncomfortable. What they don't usually mean is that somebody turned around and said, get that kid out of here. We got children's church for a reason. That kid can't understand anything. It's useless in here. Put them somewhere where it's appropriate. Nobody ever says that. But what people do sense is the tense shoulders. That's what they sense. And what, you, what we can do is, we can do two things. We can send nonverbal signals that I like it when your kids are in here. Your kids have just as much a right to worship our Heavenly Father as I do. You can send nonverbal signals. You can also send verbal signals, like hang in there. We've all been there. You know, it's okay. It's crazy in here anyway. Yours is not the only kid that's in here making noise. You can offer to like help with the kid so that that, oh, this is a new members class uh, that we talked about this last Sunday night. You can offer to help with the kid. Hey, it, you know, if your toddler is making noise, let him come sit with me for a service so that you can kind of sit and relax and hear the sermon. But all these things flow out of what? The notion that baptism 
saves and that our kids have value in the eyes of the Lord, not just because they were made in his image, because they were redeemed by the same Jesus that redeemed us, because they are filled by the same Holy Spirit that filled us, because they have a right to learn God's word and to be taught God's word, even as infants, just like you and I have a right and a privilege to, be heard, to, to hear and be taught God's word. So to learn and value. But the last thing I want to say, and then we're going to be done. And I know this is going on a little bit long. I'm trying to cram everything I want to say about baptism into this few minutes. Hope and comfort. This is the main thing I want you guys to walk away. And originally, this was kind of my main takeaway from the sermon, is this, is that I want you guys to know, to have the hope and comfort of knowing that you objectively belong to God. And what evangelicalism is going to tell you is, the way that you know that you're really a Christian is, do you really deep down believe in God? Do you have the true affections of a Christian? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Are you growing in your devotional life? All these sorts of things. Are you seeing like victory over sin? That's how you know that you're truly a regenerate Christian. And what I want to say is that I want you to have growth in your devotional life. I want you to have victory over your sin. God freely gives us these sorts of things as a gift. I want us to experience the true affections of a believer for God. God gives us those gifts. But if you start looking at those things, you are going to be driven to despair. And what I want you to look at is your baptism and say, I've been baptized. I'm a child of God, no questions asked. I belong to Jesus. Look, imagine that you were adopted into a family. And you were told you are a full-fledged child of this family. But growing up, you have a sneaking suspicion. Some of you are adopted, maybe you've experienced this. You have a sneaking suspicion that maybe my parents think a little bit differently about me than they do about my biological brothers and sisters like that, that, that belong to them biologically. And maybe, there's a, maybe I'm missing out on a little bit. Maybe there's a little bit less affection for me. And if you at any point have any doubts about whether you're truly a child of that family, the thing to do is not to look deep inside of yourself and ask, does my mom really love me? Have I done enough things to to indicate to my mom that I love her so that she would reciprocate? The thing to do is to go dig around in that file and look at your adoption papers and say, there it is. I'm a full-fledged member of this family. I objectively belong to this family and nobody can ruin it. Look at your baptism. Think about this. He sacrificed himself for you. He put his objective stamp on you so that you can always know you belong to him and you're his child. Have hope and comfort in that. Have hope and comfort in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Applied to you in word, fed to you in bread and wine, put on you in the water of baptism. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we thank, you. we thank and praise you for your salvation. We thank and praise you for committing yourself to your fallen human race by becoming human, by, dying, by sending your son to die on a cro- become human and die on a cross from us and rise from the dead for us. By taking that salvation, which he won for us on the cross, and applying it to us here in the, in the now, in Glen Carbon, through the means of grace, through your word and through the water of baptism and through the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for everyone who needs the hope and comfort of baptism this morning, and that's all of us. Father, we're all struggling with physical pain or with emotional pain, uh, broken relationships. A lot of us are worried about money. A lot of us are worried about um, our family who are sick, maybe. And we need hope and comfort. We need to know that you're going to make all things new. We need to know that your baptism of us into your holy name is going to reap benefits, specifically the benefits of resurrection power. And so make that real in our lives, God, either here now, which would be just great, but we trust you for your will because we know that eventually you are gonna raise us. You're gonna raise our relationships. You're gonna raise our bodies and you're gonna renew our minds and renew our spirits and make all things new. We pray especially this week that you would bless and give strength and hope and comfort and healing to Pastor Ken Kiley and Larry O'Leary, who both had heart surgeries this past week, that you would uh, continue pouring energy and strength and power into their bodies and to to heal them to full strength. I pray that you would be with um, uh, everyone else, Lord, who have health prayer requests but who are, for whatever reason, are timid about uh, saying them out loud and uh, keeping them quiet, that you would bring them hope and comfort as well in your son's resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we praise and thank you this morning for our mothers and uh, the plan that you've uh, made by teaching us about who you are, whether we grew up in unbelieving families or believing families, but your plan to teach us about who you are and your love for us by giving us fathers and especially mothers. Uh, We praise and thank you for that and for the love that we received, which gave us security for uh, the hope that we got from them. That gave us the boldness to step out and uh, be who you called us to be in our vocations. We just pray that you would bless all of our mothers this morning and that you would continue to pour out your uh, love and mercy on them and um, to help them to see and to know and realize how thankful and grateful we are to you for the gift of them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, especially appropriate on uh, a Mother's Day would be uh, our prayer of thanksgiving to you for... uh, the lives of the marginalized which you have chosen to redeem, the poor that you have chosen to bind yourself to, those who are uh, oppressed by the powers that be that you've chosen to rescue and save as you tell us all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We especially thank you that uh, for for all the gains, uh, small gains, big gains that are made in the fight for the lives of the unborn, we pray that you would continue this, Father, but help us not to be content with uh, political victories, uh, although... uh, they're definitely welcome and prayed for, and we're super grateful for them. But Father, work in the hearts of our culture, our culture which increasingly it's becoming apparent that we, uh, we, value, we value merit and production. And, and when those things aren't there, Father, we're totally comfortable with killing those who don't have merit in our own eyes or don't produce what we think they need to produce. And Father, judge that in our culture and wash it away and burn it with fire and call us, every one of us, to repentance, to value the life which, which is made in your image wherever that's found. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray these prayers. We pray them with boldness because they're prayers that come straight from your word. They're prayers which, which come straight from what we know about your heart from us in your gospel. And we know that you've invited us to come and pray these prayers to you. You've invited us to call you Abba, Father. And we know that because you've given us your Holy Spirit You've sent your son Jesus to die and rise for us. He's risen to your right hand to rule over all things, even Glen Carbon. He's poured out the water of his holy baptism on us and called us by his name, made us his daughters and sons. And so we come into your throne room with boldness, not because of anything that we've done right, not because of anything that's a credit to us, but because you've loved us enough to call us by your name and bring us in here. And we only pray these prayers in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But mainly we're bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us, us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. pray in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus Christ, true God who died for me. I wonder much at his love as he hung on the tree. Yeah.
And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. If anybody wants to or needs to pray, please come forward after the service and there'll be people up here who'd be happy to pray with you. Go in peace.